Season 2 begins with Arisu, Yusagi, Kuina, and Shishiya gathered at the Shibuya intersection, where Arisu began his first game. Despite having waited for over an hour, no game announcements or instructions appear on the screen. Meanwhile, Yusagi begins to notice a strange noise coming from a distance. She concentrates on it for a while until several people arrive in their vehicles and announce that the game has just begun. Kuina recognizes them as beachgoers, and they've come to play the game. Surprising everyone, someone starts shooting the players out of nowhere, causing them to flee in search of a safe place to hide. Arisu, Yusagi, Kuina, and Shishia all flee for cover. Nobody can identify the sound or the location from which an assault rifle is being fired, killing the people. They have no choice but to flee and wander aimlessly. When Arisu notices the chaos, he suggests that his group disperse and find a place to hide on their own. Following that, they attempt to avoid bullets by hiding behind cars parked along the roadside. While they are hiding, a massive King of Spades card attached to a moving plane flies overhead. When Arisa notices this, he realizes that the person shooting at them is the King of Spades and that there is only one person in charge of the shooting. Arisu and Yusagi are able to find hiding places after their separation. At that moment, Arisu notices a man in a mask and a black coat approaching them, and everyone assumes he is the real King of Spades. The masked man begins shooting and killing people who are wandering the streets. Arisu attempts to save a boy who is injured on the side of the road, but when he and Yusagi bring him behind a car, they discover that he is already dead. Kuina and Shishia are hiding behind the car next to them. They now realize they have nowhere to go and will be killed by the masked man, also known as the King of Spades. Fortunately, Arisu notices in driving a car and comes to a complete stop in front of them. Tata appears through the window and instructs the group to enter as quickly as possible. Except for Chishia, everyone gets into the car. Unfortunately, as he is about to enter, he notices a grenade near the car thrown by the masked man and requests that Anne and the group leave without him. Tatya then drives away from the scene and leads the group to a safe location. Kuina appears concerned about Chishia, but Arisu assures her that Chishia is a brave man who can care for himself. The group begins discussing various hypotheses about Myra's nature and her presence in the game as soon as Tatya drives them away from the gunshot scene. Furthermore, the city as a whole is the battleground, the plane's widespread flight indicates that this time, the entire metropolis is the game's playing field. Mira, on the other hand, can be seen enjoying Mira the massacre despite her anguish. Moving on, while the group is attempting to stay alive, the masked man kills four other participants in a car and steals their car in order to follow the group. Soon after, he approaches Arisu and the rest of the group and begins shooting at them. When it notices Tatya driving slowly, she takes over the wheel and drives the car at full speed, crashing in the middle of the road. Fortunately, no one is hurt. The masked man arrives shortly after, and he continues to shoot at people, and breaks away from the group as everyone rushes to a nearby building. Rather than staying in the same building, Arisu and Yusagi leave to find food for the group, while Tatya and Kuina go in search of a vehicle to get around. Tatya and Kuina arrive at a car showroom moments later, where Tati chooses a beautiful and expensive car for their ride and expresses his delight that he does not have to pay for it. Despite his freedom, Tatya wishes to return to the real world and live with his family, which Kuina concurs with. Meanwhile, Arisu and Yusagi raid a grocery store, gathering all edible items they can find. Arisu becomes emotional as he selects the food, remembering his friends and the time he spent with them. At the same time, Yusaki tells him that she has always wanted to be a salesperson and packs the food in a bag. Yusaki notices a magazine with her late father's picture on the front page before leaving the store and tells Arisu that she wants to stay in this gaming world and does not want to return to the human world. Arisu promises to protect her and be by her side at all times after hearing her side of the story. Tatya and Kuina arrive in a car later, while Arisu and Yusaki are walking on the road carrying the food supplies, and drive away after Arisu and Yusaki get inside. The next morning, the group realizes there is no end to the game and that if they continue to hide, the masked man will eventually find them and kill them. Then, Arisu and the group begin to map out their locations in order to gather more specific information about other games that might want to join them. Arisu informs his group that in order to stay alive in the game, they must outperform the masked man, disrupting the game master's strategy and eliciting more information. Arisu and his group decide to follow the King of Clubs as it floats around the port because club games are all about cooperation and teamwork. Furthermore, he mentions that the King card may reveal additional information. The group quickly leaves the area in their car and arrives at the location where a large card of the King of Spades is floating. When they arrive at a container-filled location, they notice five bracelets placed on a table, 
but the game requires five participants before it can begin. Nuragi appears unexpectedly and mentions that he has already worn one of the bracelets, much to their surprise. Everyone is surprised to see him alive after being burned in the fire. The group members put on the bracelet one by one, and as soon as they do, a gate opens, transporting them to the game arena. Other people appear as soon as they walk through the gate. The king of clubs introduces himself as Kuma as well, and for some strange reason, he is naked. He addresses each of his team's players and explains why he is standing without clothes. He mentions nudism as a respectable practice and a social movement with a long history. He claims that clothing is a human invention that is not always necessary for survival. Arisu and his group are astounded to learn that Kuma and his group are residents of this realm. Moving on, we see a flashback of Kuma's team when they were a rock music band, with Kuma as their lead singer. Back in the present, Kuma informs Arisu and his group that he is the leader and that he and his teammate, Shertera, created this game. Shertera then clarifies that this is also a new experience for them because, despite living in this world, Kuma and his team have never appeared in games together. Kuma then informs Arisu that they, too, are fighting for their lives, and that whichever team loses, all of the members will be killed. The game soon begins, and Kuma names it Osmosis. He then begins informing the other group of the game's rules. He claims that the game will last two hours and that both teams will collect points throughout the game, with the winning team being the team with the most points at the end of the game. He also mentions that each team starts with 10,000 points, and that before the game begins, the participants must distribute these points among themselves in whatever amount they want. Kuma then specifies three methods for obtaining points in this game, fighting the opponent, discovering hidden equipment, and touching the opponent's base. Kuma continues by explaining that the individual points are displayed on the bracelet and that they can also team up to combine their scores and attack an opponent. Without earning any points, the individual is not permitted to learn the score of the opponent. Concerning the base rules, Kuma states that if an individual touches the opponent's base pole, he or she can earn 10,000 points for the team, which has a significant impact on the game. The player who tries to touch the opponent's base will be shot down by the laser from the top of the post guard and will also lose 10,000 points. Now that the actual game is about to begin, Arisu and the squad should remember the game rules. The game then begins, with both teams dispersing in different directions. Arisu devised the entire point allocation strategy, predicting that fast runners would receive fewer points while slow runners would receive more based on his pattern study. He then assigns Tadia to guard the base with as few points as possible, and divides the remaining four into two groups. Yusagi and Mirage are the first to go out and collect points by touching the opponents, while Arisu and Kuina begin their search for the hidden items. After a while, Yusagi and Naragi are able to touch an opponent and gain some points. Similarly, Kuina discovers a hidden item and earns 2,000 points. Unfortunately, as soon as Kuina and Arisu exit the container after collecting their points, Kuma is waiting for them outside. He tries to persuade the two to fight him, but Arisu decides to fight him alone. Surprisingly, Arisu receives 2,000 points as soon as Kuma touches him, making Kuma the loser. Later, Kuina and Arisu manage to corner Shertera and engage him in combat for a 2,000-point victory. Kuma's biggest mistake was distributing the points evenly among the entire team. Shertera and Kuma decide to target Tata, who is immediately defending the base, after learning that Arusi's team is 6,000 points ahead of them. They conclude that it is the only way to re-enter the game, despite the risk of losing their lives. Kuma and his team, with the exception of Yuta, approach Tata while Arusi's squad is searching for the hidden objects. When Tata notices Kuma's squad preparing to attack, he taps the base and increases his points to infinite. During the attack, Gokan, Kuma, and Maki successfully touch the opponent's base pole, but Shertera is unable to do so because Tata touches him, causing Shertera to lose all of his points and be eliminated from the squad. The King's team now leads by 4,000 points as a result of this strategy. With their team now on the losing side, Arisu's team is forced to split up once more and search for valuable items in order to reclaim the lead. They make the decision to obtain anything that will allow them to increase their points. As soon as everyone disperses, the King team begins pursuing each of them in an attempt to score more points. Kuma's team members successfully touch Kuina and Yusagi to earn points. While this is going on, Arisu discovers an item, but Yuta touches it first and gains 3,000 points, extending her team's lead to 12,000 points. Right then, Kuma arrives and tells Arisu that the game is cruel and reminds him that it is a team sport rather than an individual one. With 30 minutes to go and the King team leading by 12,000 points, Arisu and the team must devise a comprehensive strategy to win the game. Arisu devises a strategy to attack Kuma's base after some thought. 
He says that if just two of his team's players touch base, they can score 20,000 points and take the lead. Because this is their only remaining option, they all agree with Arisu. They decide to disperse and agitate their opponents. Yusagi is successful in diverting Goken's attention, but the other members of Kuma's team continue to surround their team's base. Kuma, Maki, and Yuta all touch the ground, earning them an infinite number of points. Arusi's team must now exercise extreme caution because if they are touched by either of Kuma's team members with infinite points, they will be killed and lose the 10,000 points. Arusi, Kuina, and Naragi dash towards Kuma's base on the count of three. Kuina diverts Maki's attention, and Arisu electrocutes Kuma because his bracelet is inactive. Naragi seizes the opportunity and touches the ground while avoiding Yuta. As soon as he does so, he goes to fight Maki, leading Kuina to run to the base. Unfortunately, Yuta and Maki form a team and successfully push Kuina away from the base, earning 500 points for their team. With only about 20 minutes left, Kuma's team leads by 300 points. In the following scene, while the rest of the team is regretting and sitting alone, Arusi is still looking for other ways to score points. Unlike her teammates, Yusagi refuses to give up and decides to fight back. She begins looking for the last remaining item and finds it, earning her team an extra 2,500 points. Niragi, on the other hand, appears to be in critical condition, having lost a significant amount of blood throughout the game. Niragi abandons his teammates and attacks Yusagi as his life is about to end. He knocks her unconscious by slamming her head against the ground when she tries to fight back. Arusi decides to attack Kuma's base for the points after realizing his team needs 500 more points to tie the game. Following that, we'll see a flashback to Tata's life, when he used to work in an automobile garage in the real world. Tata's optimism inspires everyone, but despite his positive outlook, he is frequently mocked. Tata wishes he could leave his job as a mechanic behind, but he cannot because it is the only way he can afford to complete several courses required for a solid educational background. Tata fails to correctly position the vehicle lifting jack one day at work, causing the car to lose balance and fall on his superior Kato, injuring his hand. Kato decides to leave work due to a significant hand injury, which has a significant impact on Tata. Back in the present, Tata decides to help Arisu and the others because he does not want the past to repeat itself and wants to do whatever he can to help his team and save their lives. Meanwhile, Yusagi, who was attacked by Naragi while attempting to rape her, collapses to the ground unconscious. Fortunately, Arisu arrives just in time and defeats Naragi while he is forcing himself on unconscious Yusagi. Naragi mocks Arisu, but is punched several times by Arisu with only 9 minutes left in the game. Following this, Arisu transports Yusagi on his back to their base, where she apologizes for not being able to assist him in the game. With only 7 minutes left, Arisu is forced to devise a strategy for reclaiming Kuma's base. Kuma, on the other hand, decides to go for a walk after being certain of his victory, and Arisu meets him by the sea. The two men have a heart-to-heart, -heart, and Arisu thanks Kuma for all of his advice earlier, and asks him to shake hands one last time. Kuma initially refuses, telling Arisu that if they shake hands, Arisu will lose some important points, but later walks towards Arisu and shakes hands. To his surprise, as soon as they shake hands, the scoreboard updates and Kuma's points are transferred to Arisu, giving his team a 500-point lead. Everyone is surprised to hear the voice announce that Arisu's team has gained points and is now in the lead. When Kuma sees Arisu's clever plan, he praises him and asks how he did it. A few minutes later, Arisu discovers Tata banging his hand against the door of a container. When Arisu notices this, she rushes over to Tata and attempts to prevent him from injuring himself. Tata informs him that he has a plan to earn points and simply wishes to take the bracelet from his grasp. Arisu initially refuses, but when Tata informs him that the rules have never mentioned any punishment for a participant who takes out their bracelet and that it is the only way to win the game, Arisu agrees and assists him in taking the bracelet out. Tata manages to take the bracelet from his grasp and give it to Arisu, earning him an additional 10,000 points. Tata's points were not stolen by the King team because he never left the base, and his bracelet is still active to gain points from the opposing team. Tata then thanks Arisu for his kindness and appreciation, as he is the only person who recognized Tata's generosity and optimism while everyone else questioned his motives. The King's team members, on the other hand, cheerfully accept their defeat and place no blame on Kuma. While waiting for the game to end, Arisa thanks Kuma once more, saying that he considers him a good friend and that he taught him the value of fighting together and believing in himself. Arisa's final question for Kuma is whether he will be allowed to return to the real world if he succeeds in these games. Kuma advises Arisu to trust his instincts, but he does not provide a definitive answer. 
Kuma simply wants Arisu to keep playing and making decisions about his future because he is in control of his own destiny. Kuma advises Arisu to live his life independently, without relying on others. Arisu tells Kuma that if they had met in the real world, they would have made wonderful friends. Kuma then accepts his defeat with dignity and stands atop a rock. Right then, lasers begin to flash from the sky, killing every member of Kuma's team. Yusaki awakens at the base after Kuina informs her of the victory. Arisu rushes back to Tata and expresses gratitude for his sacrifice. Tata dies as a result of excessive blood loss, and Arisu bids him farewell by burying his body near the ocean. Following that, Kuina, Arisu, and Yusagi swear an oath to fight and win the games in his honor. This time, even Naragi appreciates Tata's efforts. The action then shifts to the Tio prison, where many players are awaiting the start of the game. Shishiya, to my surprise, is also present. The players are all prepared, wearing their respective collars and waiting to play the game in the central guardroom. The name of the game is then revealed, and it is solitary confinement. The game's rules are displayed on a large TV, and a lady makes an announcement informing everyone that they must correctly predict the card sign that will appear on the back of their individual collars. For a change, they are not permitted to examine the card signs on their own and must seek assistance from another player. It is also stated that if the player gives the incorrect answer, the collar will explode, killing them instantly. To save their lives, the players must find a jack of hearts hidden among them. The twist in the game is that the players must identify the jack of hearts as soon as possible to avoid being imprisoned there indefinitely. There is enough food and water inside to last them their entire lives, and the only way out is to find the jack of hearts. Individuals immediately form groups to learn one another's symbols after the rules are announced, and Shishia also finds a genuine partner. As each round ends, the group members begin to betray one another by lying about the symbol on their collar. As a result, the player tells the incorrect symbol when asked, and their collar explodes, killing them instantly. As the symbol changes, only six members remain at the end of round nine. Unfortunately, Chizia's partner can no longer handle the stress and decides to leave the game. When the computer asks him about his symbol, he says nothing and dies when his collar explodes. Chizia is now completely alone in the game, and the only thing he can do is trust his own intuition. Chizia can be seen alone on a bench in the following scene, wondering how to decipher the true symbol in his collar. Shishia makes an effort to communicate with one of the players named Matsushita in order to learn his symbol after realizing he cannot win this game alone. Unfortunately, Matsushita is linked to Sonato, a serial killer who may be the Jack of Hearts. Shishia informs Matsushita of Sonato's murder of many people for his benefit, and tries to persuade him that he can betray him at any time. Shishia also tells Matsushita his true symbol in order to gain his trust, but Matsushita lies to him and walks away. Fortunately, another girl, Katoko, arrives later to take some food from the storage, and Shishia asks her about his symbol. Unfortunately for him, she does not speak to him and instead chooses to ignore Chishia. Moving on, Chishia will be competing alone in the next round against two other pairs. Despite the pairing, Matsushita is able to trick other players into lying about their partner's symbols. Later, when it comes time to reveal their symbol inside solitary confinement, Chishia goes with his gut instinct and chooses a diamond as the answer. Matsushita steps out of the confinement alone, convinced that he is the last one standing, and laughs maniacally. To his dismay, Chizia, Sonato, and Yaba also escape the confinement, despite Matsushita's deception about their symbols. Chizia then accuses Matsushita of being a jack of hearts, but he politely declines. Chizia demonstrates this by telling him how he witnessed him and Kokoto meeting in the cafeteria and communicating each other's symbols without speaking, but with the help of different flavors of cookies. Despite this, Matsushita refuses to be a jack of hearts, but the three boys quickly capture him, lock him in a cell, and begin beating him. While Yaba and Sanato continue to beat Matsushita, Chizia escapes from the prison and the floating plane carrying the Jack of Hearts burns down. The scene that follows is from a documentary made by a survivor named Kaido Kamayama. He interviewed several people and included excerpts from their stories in his documentary. After watching this video, it is clear that the world has become a welcoming place for drug users, criminals, and thieves. Many of them claim to have great freedom, with no rules to abide by, and are grateful to be a part of this world. The Game Masters, according to Kaido, have fundamentally altered their way of life and rendered them useless. The survivors will have to keep playing these games in order to find out if there is still a chance to return to normal life. Kuina sets out the next morning to find An and Shishia out of concern for them. Nonetheless, Arisu and Yusagi require more players in their group to continue winning these games. 
Yusagi and Arisu are reassured by Kuina that they will meet again. After a few days, Arisu is still unable to accept Tada's death. Arisu recalls all the good times he had with his friends Karub and Shota. He recalls that when he was at his lowest, they always encouraged him to stay strong and choose the right path in order to survive. Yusaki goes out looking for food one day but comes up empty-handed. She then returns to Arisu and requests that he assist her in finding some food to eat. She suggests they go hunting for meat for the day. Arisu, who is also hungry, joins Yusaki in catching a rabbit in a nearby park. They try and fail several times to capture the rabbit. Arisu eventually tires and gives up. Right then, the duo notices a thudding sound nearby and decides to investigate. They follow the sound until they reach the main road, where a large number of people are dead on the ground. Arisu notices Kaito among the dead people and approaches him. Kaito can only tell them about the various films he has captured during his time in the place before dying. Arisu enters Kaito's vanity van to learn more and discovers numerous recordings. He and Yusagi decide to play each of them and discover that Kaito recorded everything with his 8mm small camera. While watching the videos, they notice In, who is studying the growth of various plants as well as the water level. And finally departs, stating that she is attempting to flee Tokyo in order to find out who is responsible for the mayhem. In the following video, Kaido travels to a Setagaya neighborhood after hearing reports about a person who can recall every detail of their birth. She is later revealed to be a woman who underwent brain surgery but remembers every detail of the abrupt transformation. The woman claims that the people she saw during the transformation were not human. Just as she is about to say something else, the King of Spades arrives and kills her along with others in the neighborhood. Returning to Arisu and Yusagi, as the documentary concludes, they hear some noise from outside. They quickly open the door and see a King of Spades flying through the air. They get out of the van and start running when they realize the King of Spades is nearby. Unfortunately for them, the King of Spades notices them and begins pursuing them. Arisu and Yusagi become separated while fleeing for their lives. Someone smacks Arisu in the face, and Arisu loses consciousness before he can realize what is going on. When Arisu regains consciousness later that night, he discovers a lady sitting beside him. Arisu asks who saved him, and she says one of her comrades is in charge of rescuing him. Following this, Arisu is taken aback when she addresses him by name. When he asks how she knows his name, she shows him the man who gave her Arisu's information. After that, Arisu approaching the man and realizing that he is none other than Aguni. He was surprised to see Aguni still alive. Aguni is the same person who gave his life to save others on the beach in the previous season. Aguni says he has no desire to live and only wants to kill the game's masters and make others' lives easier. On the one hand, Arisu is overjoyed to have Aguni back, but he also wants to go search for Yusagi. Aguni tells Arisu that the game is ideal for someone like him who has no hope of survival. He then asks Arisu about his motivation for living, assuming that he is doing all of this for Yusagi. Arisu, on the other hand, denies it and recalls Kuma's words that a person does not need reasons to live. Following this, Aguni informs Arisu that he has joined forces with the girl he met previously, Akane, to lure the King of Spades to the forest and eliminate him. Akane is a disabled girl who lacks the lower half of one of her legs. The scene then flashes back to Akane's high school days with her friends. Akane is a beautiful and popular high school girl, and many boys admire and follow her because of her beauty. Akane and her friends are walking out of their school when they hear a loud bang and see fireworks in the sky. Akane finds herself in a large football field, with a message on her phone screen informing her that the game is about to begin. They are also given the rules of the game, the boiling death, in which they must escape before the arena collapses in order to survive. After a while, the ground begins to tremble, and Akane dashes toward the ground's exit. The ground soon tears apart, releasing a large volume of boiling water. Because of the heat of the water, the people are instantly killed, but Akane survives. Unfortunately for her, she finds herself among the ruins of a building, with a rod impaling her leg. She sobs for a while before pulling out the rod and looking around for help. She reaches a hospital after crawling through an opening and asks the doctor for assistance. Unfortunately, the doctor informs her that her leg is severely infected and that he will have to amputate it in order to keep her alive. Furthermore, he stipulates that he will only treat her if she agrees to sleep with him. With a desperate desire to live, Akane agrees to his proposal and has her leg amputated. Aguni, on the other hand, recalls Hatter, an old friend, and fantasizes about conversing with him. This time, Hatter uses hurtful words to discourage Aguni from opposing the King of Spades. He also accuses him of murdering innocent people in the previous season in order to find the witch. Aguni wants to die, 
but he creates the scene as if Hatter is forcing him to. Arisu awakens the next morning to find Akane changing clothes. Akane tries to force herself on him after mentioning how uncertain their lives are, but Arisu pushes her away. Aguni arrives just then, and Akane takes a step back. While Arisu wishes to go in search of Yusagi, Aguni forbids him from going alone and advises him to stay together because they are vulnerable to attack by the King of Spades. The King of Spades will strike as soon as Arisu is seen nearby. Aguni also mentions that the Game Masters use tracking devices and other tools to track down the players. Aguni describes several strategies, one of which makes use of the mountains. Aguni, Akane, and Arisu plan to entice the King of Spades to the mountains and attack him there. Soon after, Aguni confirms an ideal location for setting up traps for the King of Spades that will alert them when he approaches their area. Arisu is guarding the location at night while also feeling sleepy. Unfortunately for him, the King of Spades arrives and points a gun at him. Fortunately, Akane arrives before he can shoot at Arisu and throws a smoke bomb to distract the King of Spades. Taking advantage of the situation, Aguni fires a couple of shots at the King, but the King of Spades is wearing a bulletproof jacket and quickly stands on his legs, suffering no damage. Next, Arisu tries to distract the King of Spades but is hit with a grenade, forcing him to jump into a river to save his life. With this, Aguni is forced to take command of the mission, but he loses his balance and suffers a head injury, causing him to lose consciousness. As Akane successfully hides an unconscious Aguni in the bushes, the King of Spades departs. The river water transports Arisu to a completely different location the next morning. He searches the area for Yusagi but is unable to locate her. Meanwhile, we're given some information about where all of the other players are. As Kuina competes in more games to extend her visa, and can be seen searching for answers and using her compass to jot down instructions. On the other hand, Yusaki comes across a young girl and a child while looking for food in a house. Yusaki tries her hardest to persuade the little kid to play games because his parents have already died and he does not have much time. When Yusaki brings him to a game arena, he is unwilling to play, but she eventually convinces him. The other attendees, on the other hand, begin to accuse Yusaki of bringing a child into the area. Surprisingly, Arisu, who was looking for Yusagi, shows up to play the same game and is ecstatic to see Yusagi there. He is relieved to have found her and makes an effort to assist her with the game. They are both relieved to see each other again, and the game begins soon after. The game is called Checkmate, and it is the Queen of Spades game. It is revealed that there are two teams in the game, the Queen team and the Challenger team, with both teams competing against one another. On the projection screen, the four Queen team members introduce themselves, while the Challenger squad has 16 members. The youngster is chosen to represent the Challenger team by the Queen of Spades, who also chose to lead her own squad. Moving on, it is revealed that all members will wear a button on their back, blue for the Challenger team and red for the Queen's team. If the opposing member presses his button, the member will be transferred to the opposing squad. The team with the most members at the end of the game wins, and the members of the losing team are killed. The Queen's team members then play the game aggressively and begin attacking the opposition, pressing their button and absorbing them into their own team. The challenger team begins to lose members one by one, and by the end of the sixth round, there are only three members left on the challenger team, Orisu, Yusagi, and the little kid. The Queen, on the other hand, appears to be interested in Orisu and wishes to incorporate him into her team. To grant her wish, her team members begin pursuing and cornering Orisu. Yusagi comes to his rescue and saves him just as they are about to press his button. Yusagi is knocked off the rails during a fight with the Queen with only three minutes remaining in the final round. She escapes, but the Queen forbids her from leaving because she is determined to destroy Yusagi at any cost. Because no one else on the team is interested in saving Yusagi, the Queen wishes for her death. Toward the end of the game, Yusagi tries to persuade the players by telling them that obeying the Queen will ensure their safety in this realm forever, but it will also eliminate any possibility of them returning to the real world. These words from Yusagi struck a chord with the people, and they began flocking to her team. Meanwhile, the Queen of Spades is commanding the current members in order to capture Arisu. Yusagi destroys a gas pipe to divert the player's attention, allowing Arisu to flee. However, the Queen's squad surrounded him with all of her players, resulting in Arisu leaping from the railing during the final 30 seconds of the round. Finally, Yusagi and Arisu bring more players to their team before the challenger team's final round and win the game, leaving the Queen alone on the other team. Before the Queen is killed according to the rules of the game, Arisu wonders if winning all of the face card games will return them to the real world. Instead of answering his question, the Queen suggests he finish all of the games and figure it out for himself. 
In the following scene, Yusagi and Arisu arrive at the ruins of a massive building and discover hot water springs. They decide to spend some time there and get close enough to kiss. Things get interesting when they notice elephants near the springs. Arisu mentions that, with all the beauty around, he has begun to like the place. The scene then shifts to Inn, who is in the jungle, looking at a dead deer and reflecting on her past as a criminal investigator. Recognizing that the deer made every effort to stay alive, and decides to leave no stone unturned in her quest for a glimmer of hope of returning to the real world. Kuina, on the other hand, arrives at the hospital where her mother was most recently admitted. She discovers a photograph of her mother after looking around. The scene then shifts to Chishia, who is shown getting ready to play a game for the King of Diamonds. The game is called the Beauty Contest, and it is being held in the Supreme Court. Shishia was given a tablet along with the other participants, and each participant had three minutes to choose any number between 0 and 100. Furthermore, the average of all the numbers chosen by the participants is multiplied by 0, 8, and the person whose answer is closest to the correct answer wins the round. If a player does not get the correct answer, he or she loses the round and a point, and if a player reaches a negative 10, he or she is eliminated from the game. The players are eliminated one by one, and a large amount of sulfuric acid is poured on them. As the game nears its conclusion, only Chishia and the King of Diamonds, Kazuryu, remain. Before the end of the second final round, Kazuryu asks Chishia if he would vaccinate rich or poor people in an emergency. Chishia, who worked as a doctor in the real world, recalls a rich man paying the hospital's director money to save his son while killing a poor child named Hayato. Chishia then selects the number 100 and informs the same Kazuryu. Kazuryu is surprised to see Chishia reveal his choice, and he can choose another number and win the game if he wants. Surprisingly, Kazuryu is captivated by Chishia's worldview and decides to save him. He then selects the number 0 and thus loses the round. With both players having minus 9 individual points, this is their last chance to secure a point and save their lives. Chishia, seemingly out of nowhere, chooses the number 100 for the final round, leading Kazuryu to decide the game. It is now up to him to choose between his and Shishia's lives. Kazuryu recalls his encounter with Momoka, the witch, from the previous season. He questions why she chose to be the witch when she knows it would mean sacrificing her life. Momoka, much to his surprise, tells him that she did so to follow her own ideals and not let any game master decide her fate. She goes on to say that the human heart is an amazing thing and that she does not want people to kill each other for the sake of a game. Momoka's words hit Kazuryu hard, and he realizes that he does not understand the true value of human life. As a result of this thought, Kazuryu selects the number zero and declares Chishia the winner of the final round. When Chishia questions him about it, Kazuryu explains that he did it to follow his ideals for the first time in his life and to leave the world guilt-free. Chishia is declared the winner as soon as he does, and a bucket of sulfuric acid is poured on Kazuryu, killing him instantly. Akane, on the other hand, decided to continue playing the game and live with the wisdom she gained from Aguni after she died fighting the King of Spades. Yusagi and Arisu wish for a better future and their survival. En and Kuina also returned to gaming with the sole intention of returning to reality. Then Sin moved to Naragi, stumbling through the city looking for someone to abuse. On his way, he comes across a seriously injured man who begs him to end his suffering. Naragi, on the other hand, ignores his request and abandons him to his fate. En and Kuina, on the other hand, happen to run into each other while playing a game. Face cards such as the Jack of Clubs, Jack of Diamonds, and King of Hearts are used in multiple games at the same time. Following these cards are games such as Throwball, Rope Climbing, and Poker. The most difficult game involves a tunnel in which players must avoid a dangerous animal that is pursuing them. En and Kuina play together and leave the arena with confidence after winning the games. We can see here that the King of Spades and Queen of Hearts are the only cards that can be obtained. This also implies that people are now required to play only two games. Next, while looking for weapons in the city, Orisu wanders around the devastated city and unexpectedly meets Chishia on the street. Chishia mentions that he has something to say to Orisu, and the two are overjoyed to see each other alive. Unfortunately, before he can say anything, Niragi arrives with a gun and begins shooting at Chizia, injuring him. Arisu tries to stop Naragi, but he refuses to listen to him. He suggests they shoot each other and end their lives. When Shizia fires blindly at them, the two flee behind the parked cars. Yusagi arrives shortly after and asks Naragi to stop shooting. Unfortunately, Naragi refuses to comply and begins shooting at her. Shishia rushes to Yusagi's aid and stands in front of her, taking the bullet intended for Yusagi. 
Meanwhile, Orisu shoots Naragi and severely injures him. Despite struggling to catch his breath, Chishiya is still pleased with his decision to sacrifice his life in order to save Yusagi and Arisu. Arisu approaches Chizia and inquires as to what he was about to say. Unfortunately, Chishiya passes out before he can say anything. A flying plane carrying the King of Spades flag appears above them, and gunfire can be heard in the distance. As people begin to react angrily, the King of Spades appears and begins shooting at them. Kuina and Nen are discovered hiding behind a vehicle by Yusagi and Arisu, and the group is reunited. Kuina asks Arisu about Chishiya's whereabouts, but he refuses to tell her anything and lies to her, telling her that Chishiya is fine. With the King of Spades killing people at random, the four of them decide to kill the King as well, fighting against him as a group. Soon after, the King of Spades, dressed in a black cloak, arrives and notices the group. Kuina is able to divert the King's attention and save him when he attacks her and takes advantage of this opportunity to flee, but the king now pursues Kuina. The king then removes his mask and cloak to reveal his face. When the king begins pursuing Arisu and Yusagi, Akane arrives just in time and shoots the king with her arrow, but it is ineffective. Surprisingly, Aguni also appears and starts shooting at the king of spades. In the following scene, the entire team reunites and devises a strategy to defeat the king of spades. They decide to lure the king inside a nearby drugstore and kill him with a massive explosion. As the king of spades collects ammunition from the flying planes, the team members force him to follow them down a narrow path away from the planes. While Kuina and Nen are diverting the king's attention, Orisu fills the drugstore with gas cans, causing an explosive explosion. Despite the fact that this act carries the risk of death, Orisu is determined to carry it out. Despite their grand plan, the king proves to be a strong and cunning human being, Everyone tries their hardest to attack and kill the king, but they all fail. When the king is about to shoot Aguni, Akane appears out of nowhere and saves him, taking bullets to the chest. Following this, the king turns to end and shoots her as well. Kuina and Yusagi also attempt to stop the king but are stabbed with knives. As he watches his friends being shot and stabbed, Aguni becomes enraged and points a gun at the king of spades. Unfortunately, the king shoots him before he can pull the trigger, and the bullet brushes against his skull, knocking him unconscious. The king then pursues Arisu while everyone else is on the ground. Arisu rushes into the pharmacy and prepares to attack him. However, the king does not enter the drugstore and instead chooses another route. Seeing this, Aguni appears out of nowhere and pushes the king inside the drugstore, breaking the door. Arisu hesitates to throw the bomb inside the drugstore after realizing Aguni is with the king, but Aguni insists. Fortunately, Aguni and Arisu escape before the drugstore explodes, saving their lives. Both the drugstore and the king have been severely damaged. He hands Aguni his gun and requests that he kill him. Aguni pulls the trigger and dispatches the king of spades without delay. Following this, when Aguni is about to commit suicide, he has another vision of Hatter, who stops him. In this scene, we see a glimpse of all the characters, and we can see that Akuna is still alive and dragging her toward Aguni. And and Kuina, meanwhile, are still alive and make a final vow to rekindle their friendship in the real world. Kuina witnesses In's death but does nothing to help her. Moving on, Arisu and Yusagi decide to play the final game and walk toward the arena where the Queen of Hearts resides. They continue to believe that if they win the final game, they will be able to return to their real world and resume their normal lives. When they arrive at the arena, they discover that the Queen of Hearts is none other than Mira. Mira welcomes them to the game arena and begins explaining the rules of the final game, Queen of Croquet. She mentions that the game has three rounds, that there will be no winner, and that all they need to do is finish the game. The game begins with four different colored balls and hoops in various locations, and both players, Arisu and Mira, begin playing it. Mira takes the first round, and Arisu takes the second. Arisu wants to finish the game quickly because Usagi is bleeding from her injured leg, but Mira keeps delaying it. Mira offers them a cup of tea after the second round, explaining that it is also part of the final game. Arisu asks Mira if they can return to their real world after completing the final game as everyone gathers around a table for tea. Mira, to his chagrin, responds that he will not receive his answers until the game is over. But first, Mira decides to inform him of some sobering facts. Mira then discusses all of the technological advances that humanity has made possible, such as artificial intelligence, cryogenics, and cell production. She also mentions that human life will be so advanced and immortal in a thousand years. Moving on, Mira informs Arisu that in the next 50 years, cancer will be cured and there will be no barrier between the rich and the poor. 
To everyone's surprise, she also claims that after 500 years, a shot of dopamine will be enough to keep humans alive, effectively making them immortal. Arisu is taken aback when Mira explains that they are playing this game digitally. Mira soon starts laughing and declares that everything she said before was false. Then Mira starts talking about genetic abnormalities and claims that their memories have been completely erased in order to force them to participate in the games. Arisu has reached the end of her patience and demands to know whether her game theory is correct. Mira lies yet again and simply shifts the subject by claiming she has no knowledge of it. When Arisu hears this, he loses patience and points a gun at her. Yusagi tries to stop him, but Arisu appears enraged from within. Soon after a brief pause, Arisu realizes that everything Mira is doing is a ruse to end the game. Because the Queen of Hearts is the final face card game, if Mira is killed, the game cannot be completed, and humans will continue to exist on this planet. Meanwhile, Yusagi realizes Mira is a skilled manipulator who is duping Arisu into believing this existence is real. But, in reality, everything in it is a lie. Mira then informs Arisu that whatever game he is playing here is entirely made up in his head. Everything is a figment of Arisu's imagination. She also mentions that all the games are connected to the deaths of his best friends, Kurub and Chota. The scene then shifts to a hospital, where Arisu is now a patient being treated by his psychiatrist, Mirakano. Yusagi is also a patient in the same hospital, receiving therapy for her father's death. Chota and Kurub, as shown in the first season, never made it to the public restroom and were killed while attempting to cross the busy road. Arisu believes he is guilty and wishes to end his life because he was unable to save his friends and lied to everyone about their deaths. Arisu believes there is no point to his existence and wishes to exit the game by taking the pills Mira instructed him to take. Yusagi then walks into the other room and begins conversing with Arisu. The game will end once Arisu reveals that he is willing to give up, which Mira is pressuring him to do. But there's a catch, once Yusagi accepts that the game is real, her legs start bleeding again. There is no way it could be an illusion because she also took part in these games. She even cuts her wrist to convince Arisu that everything is true. Finally, as Yusagi is about to pass out, Arisu talks to her and decides to spend the rest of his life with her. He then decides to continue playing the game, and the scene returns to the rooftop as soon as he says so. Mira makes the decision to begin the decisive round after realizing she is doomed to lose. Arisu is adamant about continuing the game and does not even consider quitting until the very end. Finally, the Queen of Hearts final round is over, and Arisu has completed all of the rounds. Finally, Arisu begs Mira to tell him about this fictional world, but Mira imposes a condition, she says they will be given two options, and regardless of which one he chooses, he will receive the answer, which will aid Arisu in learning about this virtual reality gaming world. Then, with fireworks lighting up the night sky, a laser falls from the sky and kills Mira. Following that, an announcement is made, asking the players to choose whether they want to remain in this realm or return to their own. Yusagi and Arisu decide to return, and all of the other characters, including Shishia, Niragi, Kuina, Aguni, and Akane, make the same decision. The world then returns to normal, and Arisu finds himself wandering the streets with his friends Kurub and Shota. All of the players who survived the game are still in the same area, but those who died appear to have met the same fate. A large meteor then strikes the earth, killing many people and destroying everything. In the following scene, Arisu awakens in the hospital, surrounded by his brother. He tells Arisu that his heart had stopped for a minute. When Arisu hears this, he responds that the minute felt like an eternity to him. Similarly, other participants are in the same hospital and have all experienced a brief cardiac arrest. Akane, who is strolling down the corridor, comes to a halt in front of an operating theater and looks at Aguni as if she recognizes him. Kuina, on the other hand, is reunited with her parents, who are overjoyed to see her alive. In the final scene of the episode, Arisu and Yusagi meet as strangers, but they both feel a connection. They talk for a while and then decide to spend some time outside the hospital. Season 2 concludes with all of the playing cards flying away from the table, leaving only the Joker card, indicating that there is still something left.